the Vaishyas from the thighs, and the Sudras from the feet. So I don't agree with this concept. That's right. So if you ask me, do you believe in the philosophy of Veda? I say no. This particular philosophy... According to anybody who inhabits this land, is a Hindu. Yes. Yes. Geographically said that. Yes. Brother rightly said that anyone who inhabits India has to be Hindu, but natural. Anyone living in America is a citizen of America. He has to be American. Very good. Alhamdulillah. So anyone living... Yes. That's it. I agree with you, brother. Geographically, everyone living in India is a Hindu. So I completely agree with it. By the geographical definition, if you say, if you say that anyone who lives in India is a Hindu, it's correct. Any scholar will agree, anyone living in India is a Hindu. Geographically, I'm a Hindu. But because I stay in India, can I be a Muslim? Yes. Of course. So a person, can a Muslim be a Hindu? Yes. If the Muslim is living in India, he can be a Hindu. But if a so-called Hindu lives in America, he's not a Hindu. You know that. He's an American. So Hinduism cannot be called a universal religion, according to the scholars. Hindu is the religion of India only. It's not a religion. It's a geographical definition. According to Swami Vivekananda, who is a great scholar, he said Hinduism is a misnomer. You know misnomer? Misnomer means a wrong label given. They should be called as Vedantists. So if you ask me, am I a Hindu? I will tell you, if Hindu is a person living in India, by all means I am a Hindu. But if you say Hindu is a person who worships, as the person said, you know, that if you believe in so and so God, we have got forms, etc., and we have got heads and hands, etc., then... I am not a Hindu. But if you mean a geographical definition, yes, I am a Hindu. Similarly, can a Hindu be a Muslim? Yes, an Indian can be a Muslim. A Hindu can be a Muslim. But if that Indian, if that Indian does idol worship, he can't be a Muslim. Because the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48, and in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgives the sin of committing shirk, associating partners. Any other sin, if he wishes, he may forgive. But shirk, he'll never forgive. So an Indian, living in India, geographical Hindu, can be a Muslim. But if that geographical Hindu, Indian, breaks any commandments, that is, the basics of concept of God, believe in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he cannot be a Muslim. Any Muslim who follows the Quran and lives in India, he's an Indian Muslim. Hope it's very clear for you. He's a Hindu Muslim. <laughs> Two things I want to make very clear. First, you might have, uh, might not have properly heard me. Uh, brother, uh, I think as far as the question answer session goes, we'll allow normally one question, you put your question completely as a question rather no. than a lecture, and let the speaker answer. After the question answer session is over, after the program is over, and when others who might not be interested in discussion, we will welcome discussion after the program so everyone else is not blocked up on one question and we give opportunities to many other people. We will love. Yes, uh, Advocate Hengji. A question answer, wow, debate ho ne. Aapan je karta hai, thi debate cha padhati na karta hai, nanta cha cha utar roosh kaya. Tara kona la prashnu vichar da chi uttar speaker de ti. Prashnan chi chi uttar amala mila li, tia mula amsa samadhan zala na hai. Aapan basa wa khali, dusya la prashnu vichar. Nahi, thik hai, tia cha kaya harkat ne amala, pakta prashna sa hai, ankhi ek aata ek prashna mi vichar. Excuse me, brother. Ki is. Brother, excuse me. I'll put forward the question on the slip. Mr. Mehtas, why are most of the Muslims Fundamentalists and terrorists. The question posed is by Brother Mehta, why are most of the Muslims fundamentalists and terrorists? The question is posed, I give the answer. If you like it, you take it. If you don't like it, leave it. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 256, like Rahaf there is no compulsion in religion, truth stands out clear from error. I present the truth to you. If you like it, you take it. If you don't like it, you reject it. No problem. There is no compulsion in religion. Like Rahaf al-Din. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256. Brother Mehta has asked a question that why are most of the Muslims fundamentalists? Why are they terrorists? 
What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist is a person who follows the fundamentals. For example, a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of maths. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of maths to be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of science. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of science to be a good scientist. For a person to be a good doctor, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of medicine. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of medicine to be a good doctor. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. You can't say all fundamentalists are bad or all fundamentalists are good. For example, you are a fundamentalist robber who is expert in the field of robbing. But he is harmful for society. He robs the people and doesn't promote bedrood. He is not a good human being. On the other hand, you are a fundamentalist doctor who follows and practices the fundamentals of medicine and he cures the sickness of human beings. He is a good person. He helps the human being. So you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. Regarding Muslim the fundamentalist, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim because I know, I follow and Alhamdulillah strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim and every Muslim to be a good Muslim should be a fundamentalist Muslim otherwise he can't be a good Muslim. Every Hindu to be a good Hindu, he should be a fundamentalist Hindu, otherwise he not be a good Hindu. Every Christian, to be a good Christian, he should be a fundamentalist Christian, otherwise he won't be a good Christian. Regarding is a fundamentalist Muslim good or bad, that's the question. Alhamdulillah, the fundamentals of Islam, there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. So far, many of the brothers pose certain questions because of the misconception. Because of the misconception, you may think that this teaching of Islam is wrong. Like brother said, having cow is wrong and I gave the answer. Brother said about certain things and I gave the answer. So a person who has lack of knowledge, he may think that there are certain fundamentals of Islam which are wrong. But if anyone who has the knowledge of Islam, there is not a single teaching of Islam which goes against humanity, goes against society. I challenge anyone, not only in this audience, in the full universe, to point out to me a single, a single teaching of Islam which is against the basics of humanity, single. Some people may feel bad, but as a whole, the teaching of Islam is best for universal brotherhood to promote humanity. There is not a single teaching and I challenge again. Anyone from the audience, they can ask me questions, I will clarify the misconception. Inshallah when the time comes, there is the next question you can pose. One question at a time. When your turn was there, you don't reply. See, the thing is that you have to follow certain rules. The mic was empty for half an hour. No one came up. I told the brother, you're most welcome. You stand on the mic, no one comes. You can keep on asking one-one question. Every third question will be your question. No problem. You can ask as many as, as much as the time the auditorium has been had for. There's no problem. So, I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. But if you read the definition of fundamentalism, in the Webster Dictionary, it says that fundamentalism was a movement which was started in the early 20th century by a group of Christian, the Protestants in America, who protested and said that not only is the Bible, the teaching of the Bible is the word of God, but every letter of the Bible is verbatim the word of God. So fundamentalism was first used for a group of Protestant Christians in America, who protested and said that every letter, word of the Bible is the word of God. If any human being who can prove that every word of the Bible is the word of God, then the movement is good. But if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not the word of God, then the movement is not a good movement. But if you read the Oxford Dictionary, what is the meaning of the word fundamentalism? Fundamentalism, according to Oxford Dictionary, means strictly adhering to ancient laws of any religion, especially Islam. In Oxford Dictionary, they write especially Islam. The word especially Islam is there in the latest edition of Oxford Dictionary. That means fundamentalists immediately think of a Muslim. Why? 
the media is bombarding people that you know that these Muslims they are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. The moment you think they were a fundamentalist, immediately people start thinking of a Muslim, start thinking of the word terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? A terrorist is a person who causes terror, who causes terror. And sometimes for peace to prevail, you may have to cause terror. When a robber sees the police, he is terrified. So for the robber, the police is a terrorist. Right or wrong? I am speaking English. I am not playing on with words. I am speaking English. Terrorist is the person who causes terror. So for the robber, for the criminal, for the antisocial element, the police is a terrorist. In this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist. In context. Should be a terrorist for the antisocial element. Whenever an antisocial element sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. Any robber sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. Any rapist sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. But I do agree that terrorist is a word normally used for terrorizing the common people, the innocent people. In this context, no Muslim should be a terrorist. He should not terrorize the innocent people. But where anti-social elements are concerned, where robbers are concerned, where criminals are concerned, as policemen are terrorists to the criminals, even the Muslim should be a terrorist to the criminal. And if you analyze, many a times, two different labels are given to the same person for his same activity. For example, you know, there were many Indians who fought for the freedom of India. When the Britishers ruled India, there were many Indians who fought for the freedom of India. The Britishers called them as terrorists. Ah, these people are terrorists. But we Indians, we call these freedom fighters as patriots. Right or wrong? Patriots. They fought for the freedom of the country. Same people, same activity, two different labels. The Britishers called them as terrorists. The Indian citizens called them as patriots, freedom fighters. Same activity, same person, two different labels. So before you give a label, you should first analyze that which view do you adhere to. If you agree with the British view, that the British government had a right to rule over India, then you would call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the Indian citizens, that the Britishers, they came to do business and they started ruling us unlawfully, then you would call these people as freedom fighters. So before you give any label to any particular person, you should analyze which view do you have. Same people can be given two different views by different people. In this context, I would say every Muslim should be a fundamentalist where Islam is concerned. Because every teaching of Islam promotes human values and humanity and universal brotherhood. Hope that answers the question. I am Dr. Devre from Bhivandi College. Well, every religion is a supreme science of life. Nothing is wrong so far as the principles of religions are concerned. But the formulation of principles is a different thing and execution of these principles is a different thing. Actually, where there is no relationship of blood, the relationship is to be established by the religions. Actually, what we find, I quote, La situfasidu fil arja ibada isallah. Is sansar me shanti prastapit hone ke baad, ashanti mat phailao, ke paigam hame mila hai. But actually what we find, what we realize, what we experience is this. The maximum blood is wasted only on account of the conflicts in the religions. So where is the wrong? I mean, what are your views about this? How would you reconcile the principles of religion and this chaos which arises on account of religion? What are your views on on this particular aspect. Thing. The professor asked a very good question that in all religion basically speak good things but the implementation may be different. They teach good things. But today you see in the world many people are fighting on the name of religion. How can you solve this problem? It's a very good question. And part of the answer I gave in my talk. And I said that as far as Islam is concerned we should not kill any human being. So in Mayada chapter 5 verse 32. How can you see to it that 
we can come to common terms. How can we solve the differences? That also mentioned in my talk in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says that Ta'ala wala kalmatin sawa'im bayna baynakum. That come to common terms as in us and you. If suppose you have 10 points and I have got 10 points. If out of those 10 points, if 5 points are common and 5 are different, I at least agree with those 5 points which are common. The differences will come to it later on. Quran says, Ta'ala wala kalmatin sawa'im bayna baynakum. That come to common terms as in us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. So you rightly said how to solve. And I have given the methodology how to solve. That come to common terms. But the point to be noted here is that many people who follow religions, they do not know what their own religious scriptures speak. That is the problem. Many Muslims don't know what the Quran and Sayyidi speak. Many Hindus don't know what Hindu scriptures say. Many Christians and Jews don't know what the Bible says. Who's to blame? Follow us. Therefore, I tell the people, you read your scriptures. The point of difference, we will come to it later on. At least come to the commonalities. I have given the talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. I say the things which we differ will come to it later on. At least what your Bible and my Quran says, let's agree with those things which are common. Fight will be solved. What I'm doing now? In my talk, did I ever criticize any religion? I was forced to reply when certain brothers tried to ask certain questions, which I have to speak the truth. Otherwise, in my talk, you can take the video cassette, I did not criticize a single point on any religion. I never spoke about the differences. I only came to common terms. Differences, I can give a talk on differences between Islam and Hinduism. Differences between Islam and Christianity. I am a student of comparative religion. I can quote verses, Alhamdulillah, from the various world scriptures, talking about differences. I keep that when required. When someone tries to disrupt the program, we have to be well aware of these things. But I never use it in my talk. I never use it as a common man. I tell the common man, you read your scriptures, you will come closer to your scriptures and to universal brotherhood. Read your scriptures, at least first believe in one God. The difference will come to later on. The difference will come to later on. Judaism says that, Christianity says that, Hinduism says that, Islam says that, Sikhism says that, Parsim says that. Believe in one God and worship Him alone. Why do you worship other gods? Come to that point, then come to other points. If we solve this problem of commonalities, if even if there are three points common out of ten, at least agree on those common points. The other points, we can agree to disagree. We'll come to it later on. So if we come on the common points first, Coming on the comparative studies, believe me, most of the problem will be solved. Believe me. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going throughout the world and I address audiences of non-Muslims and many of them because they're not aware of their scriptures, of our scriptures, many people post questions. Even Muslims aren't aware of the scriptures. So they post questions which they aren't aware of. So I educate them. I educate them about Quran, about Hadith, about Vedas, about Bible and I quote. When I quote, I give the reference number. So no one can say, oh, Zakir is pulling a fast one. And all these scriptures are quoted. It's available in the Islamic Research Foundation. Our library has the various translation of Vedas. We have hundreds of types of Bibles. More than 30 different versions of the Bibles we have. Alhamdulillah. So whichever sect you belong to, whether you are Jehovah's Witnesses or Protestant or Catholic, I speak from their scriptures. So if you say that Zakir is wrong, you have to say that the Holy Scripture is wrong. I quote, and most of my talks are quotations. Quotations from various scriptures. If you disagree with the scriptures, that's your choice. If you want to disagree, you most of them disagree. Because Quran says, like Rafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. So I am presenting the truth of Hinduism to you. If you want to agree, agree. Do not, don't agree. There is a symposium. The third cassette from there. Symposium on concept of God on Islam, Hinduism, Christianity. People may call it a debate. A Hindu Pandit from Kerala and Calicut, a Christian father of Calicut, and I myself presented the Islamic view. Four and a half hours debate. It's available outside. Scholars of Hinduism, of Christianity, I am just a student. I'm presenting my view. And it's for the audience to judge. I'm talking about similarities. Quoting their scriptures, chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. The best way to cause all the human beings to unite 
is find the commonalities. Speak about the differences later on. Hope that answers the question. The next question would be from the slip. Then, if the sister will allow, uh, there is one Raj Malotra. He is asking if Islam is a religion of peace, then how come it was spread by the sword? The question posed was, if Islam is a religion of peace, how come it was spread by the sword? Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It also means submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as I mentioned earlier, that everyone in the world does not want peace to prevail in the world. There are certain anti-social elements for their own benefits. They don't want peace to prevail. The robbers, the criminal. If peace will prevail, they will go out of business. So for their own benefit, there are certain human beings who don't want peace to prevail. So for such types of people, force may have to be used. Therefore, we have police, etc. So, Islam is for peace, but sometimes you may have to use force to put the anti-social elements in their place. And the best answer to this question, that Islam was spread by the sword, is given by D. Lacey O'Leary. He's a non-Muslim historian of great repute. In his book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number 80 says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary, page number 8, book Islam at the Crossroad. I'm asking you a question that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. Later on, the Crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a Muslim who could openly give the Azan the call for prayers. We didn't use any force. You know, we Muslims, we ruled the Arab lands for about 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came. For a few years, the French came. But overall, the Muslims were the lordship of the Arab land for 1400 years. Do you know today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians since generations. Since generations. If the Muslims wanted, they could have converted every non-Muslim at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. The 14 million Arabs or Coptic Christians are giving witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. You know India? India was ruled for hundreds of years by the Muslims. We didn't use the sword. When you use the sword, if you people do a wrong thing, you can't catch up those people and blame the religion for that. If you people don't follow the religion, you can't say that Christianity is bad because Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews. If Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews, burned 6 million Jews, you can't blame Christianity for that. There may be black sheep in every community, but we Muslims, we ruled India for hundreds of years. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to convert at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. The non-Muslims of India today, more than 80%, they are giving shahada, they are giving witness. You non-Muslims present here are giving witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. You are giving witness. We had the power. We didn't do it. Islam doesn't believe in that. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims is Indonesia. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia, which has 55% population of Muslims? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle gives the reply. Thomas Carlyle, he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, that you have to get the sword. Little good will it do that he should spread with the sword. Every new opinion initially begins in the mind of one. One man in the whole world. One man against all the human beings. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. Which sword? Even if we had the sword, we can't use it. Even if we had the metal sword, we can't use it. Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, Like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Anyone who grasps the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and rejects the evil, he has held the most strong handhold that never breaks. Anyone who believes in Allah, Allah will take him from darkness to light. Anyone who believes in the evil, the Satan one, he will take him from lightness to dark. 
Which sword? Sword of the intellect. Quran says in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 125, Wal Mawazit al Hasna, Wajadilum Billati Ahasan. Invite all the way of the Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. There was an article that came in the Plainfield magazine. It was a reproduction of the Reader Digest and Manager book, 1986. It gave the statistics of the increase of the world religion between 1934 to 1984. In the 50 years, number one increase in major religion was Islam, 235%. 235%. I am asking you, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which converted millions of non-Muslims to Islam? Which war? Do you know today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam? Who is forcing the Americans to convert the point of the sword? The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. Who is forcing the point of the sword? Quran gives the answer in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 33. In Surah Saf chapter 61 verse number 9. And Surah Fatah chapter 48 verse 28. The glorious Quran says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَ رَسُولُ وَبِالْهُدَىٰ وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُزْهِرَوَ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدًا وَقَرِيَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Allah says that Allah has sent His Messenger with truth and with guidance so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other ism. Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. Kulli. Enough is Allah as a witness. And i like to end this answer by giving the quotation of Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said that people who fear that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Uh, there's a question from Brother Sunni Ilyas. When Islam preaches universal brotherhood, then how come Muslims themselves are divided into sects? The question posed is that when Islam preaches universal brotherhood, how come Muslims are divided into various sects? The answer is given in the glorious Quran. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, it says, Wa tasimu bi habdillahi wa Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Which is the rope of Allah? The glorious Quran is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says that the Muslims should hold to the rope of Allah, the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith, and they should not be divided. And the Quran says, as I mentioned earlier, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, that anyone who divides the religion into sects, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will tell him about the affairs on the day of judgment. That means it is prohibited for anyone to make sects in the religion of Islam. But when you ask certain Muslims, what are you? Some say I'm a Hanafi, some say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Hamli, some say I'm a Malaki. What was the beloved Prophet? Was he Shafi? Was he Hanbali? Was he Maliki? What was he? He was a Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 52 that Jesus peace be upon the Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 67 that Abraham was a Muslim. And what is the beloved Prophet? You are the Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Fusila chapter 41. Verse number 33, Woman hasan who call a mimman da in Allahi, wa amil salihaum, call a inna ni minal muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says, I am of those who bow to the will of Allah, those who say, I am a Muslim. So when anyone poses the question, What are you? you should say, I am a Muslim. I have no objection if someone says, I believe in certain verdicts. Certain views given by great scholars like Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. May Allah be pleased with them all. I respect all these great scholars. If someone agrees with certain views of Imam Shafi, sometimes may Allah be pleased with him. Sometimes Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him. I've got no objection. But if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say you're a Muslim. And as the brother said earlier, that Quran says there will be 73 sects. What is referring to is saying of beloved Prophet. It's mentioned in Abu Dawud, hadith number 4579. It says that the religion of Islam will be divided into 73 sects. But if you note the wording of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that the religion will be divided. He didn't say you should divide the religion. He's prophesizing. Though the Quran says don't be divided, the Muslims are bound to divide. And there's another hadith 
which is mentioned in Trimedi, Hadith number 171, the beloved Prophet said, there will be 73 firqas, 73 sects. And all will go to hell except for one. And the companions asked, which one? The Prophet said, the one that is on the path of the Prophet and the companions. One that follows the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So anyone who follows the Quran and Hadith is on the true path. Islam doesn't believe in division. Every person, he is a Muslim. Anyone who follows the Quran says he is a Muslim. And Islam is against dividing the religion into sects and divisions. So if you read the Quran and say Hadith, Muslims should be united on the basis of Quran and say Hadith. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. We'll allow two questions before we have the impressions of our chief guests and the presidential address by Advocate Hingorani. Yes, brother. I am a retired teacher, Lakshman Dokras Guruji. I want to ask, what is the exact remedy to increase the universal brotherhood? For which subjects we have to give priority? Either for religion or sociology or politics. Will you please tell me please kindly what is The brother asked the question that what is the priority to spread universal brotherhood? Is it religion? Is it sociology? Is it dealing with politics? Brother, I have given the talk based on that full topic. I don't have to repeat the same thing. My answer will be the same. The priority to spread universal brotherhood in all the religions is to believe in one God and worship Him alone. That is the basic priority. I have repeated that in the talk. I have repeated an answer to several questions and I am repeating it again. The basic priority is not sociology or politics. That comes later on. Politics deals with brotherhood which is limited. Sociology which is limited. Believe in one God is universal. He is the one who created all human beings, whether male or female, whether black or white, whether rich or poor. So if you believe in one God and worship Him alone, then there will only be universal brotherhood. Hope that answers the question. The next question, I think is something connected. Uh, one brother, Prabhu is asking, all the religions basically preach good things. Uh, thus, a person can follow any one of the religion. It is one and the same. The question posed is that all the religion basically teach good things. So you can follow any religion, it's one and the same. And I do agree with him in the first part of the question that all religions do basically preach good things. For example, all religions say you should not rob, you should not molest a woman, you should not rape her. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says that. But the difference between Islam and the other religions is that Islam, besides speaking of good things, it shows you a way how to implement those good things. Like all religions speak about brotherhood. But Islam practically shows you, it demonstrates how to practice it in your day to day life. Salah, Hajj, etc. So Islam, besides speaking theoretically, it shows you a way how to practice it in your life. For example, Hinduism says you should not rob, Christianity says you should not rob, Islam says you should not rob. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. That is, every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being gives charity, Poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. After this, the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people may say, chopping off the hands in this age of 20th century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. And I do know that there are thousands of people who rob. So if you chop off all the people, then many people lose their hands. But the law is so strict that the moment you implement it, and if a person comes to know that his hands will be chopped off if he robs, immediately the thought of robbing will go away from his mind. Do you know today America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, unfortunately it also has one of the highest rates of crime. Highest rate of robbery and theft. 
I am asking you a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that is every rich person gives zakat, 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity, and after that if any man or woman drops, chop of his or her hand, I am asking you a question. Will the rate of robbery and theft in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Let me give you another example. That most of the major religions say that you should not molest a woman, that you should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not, men will not molest or rape a woman. Islam has a system of hijab. People normally talk about hijab for the woman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 that said to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman and any brazen thought comes in his mind, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. There was once a friend of mine, was a Muslim friend, who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's prohibited in Islam to stare at a girl. So he told me, our beloved Prophet said, that the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the Prophet mean by saying the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited? He didn't mean that you can look at a woman and stare continuously at her for 20 minutes without blinking. What the Prophet meant that if you look at a woman unintentionally, intentionally don't look at her again, don't feast on her. That's what the Prophet meant. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 31 says, that say to the believing woman, that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of. And to draw a head covering over the bosom. And display not her beauty except in front of her husband, her father, her son, etc. And a big list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And there are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands of the wrist. Some scholars say even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. Sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. These are basically six criteria for hijab mentioned in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And the Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 59, giving the reason for hijab. It says, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that it will prevent them from being molested. And the Islamic Sharia says, if anyone rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment. People with capital punishment in this 20th century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. It's a barbaric religion. Do you know America, which happens to be the country which is supposed to be most advanced, it has one of the highest rate of rape. According to the statistic, it says that on an average every day, more than 1,900 females are being raped every day. Every 1.3 minute, one female is raped. Since the time I'm in this auditorium, it's more than two and a half hours. How many rapes may have taken place? How many? More than 100 in America. I am asking you a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that is every man, when he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. The woman should be properly dressed up in the hijab. And after that, if any man rapes, capital punishment. I am asking you a question. Will the rate of rape increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease the practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. And I have asked this question to non-Muslims that Suppose someone rapes, unfortunately, your wife or your mother. And if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give? 
and believe me, all of them said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extent of saying, we will torture him to death. So why do you have the double standards? Someone rapes somebody else's wife, capital punishment is barbaric law. Someone rapes your wife, you want to give him capital punishment. Why these double standards? And do you know in India, according to the statistics of Crime Bureau, it says that every 54 minutes, one case of rape is reported in India. How many taking place? Every few minutes maybe, one case. And no wonder, if you have read the papers of about 10 days back, on the 20th of October, the Home Minister of India, L.K. Adwani, you know what he said? It came in headlines of Times of India. Headline. What it says? That Adwani, Adwani puts a death rap for rape and recommends an amendment in the law. Headlines in Times of India, 20th of October, 10 days back. On Tuesday, one day before, 27th of October, 1998, he said that he wants death penalty for the rapist. Alhamdulillah. What Islam has said 14 years ago, L.K. Adwan is saying that, and I congratulate him for that. I am not here to promote any political party, I am not a politician. But if someone speaks the truth, I have to appreciate it. And if you implement this, surely the rate of rape will diminish. Maybe the next Home Minister may implement the Islamic hijab here also. So inshallah, the rape will be completely abolished. They are coming closer to Islam, I appreciate it. Ta'ala will akal mithin sabah impayna na bainakum. Come to common terms, that has been us and you. Mr. L.K. Advani realized that rape is increasing in India and he rightly recommended that the law should be amended and death penalty should be put for the rapist. And I am for it. I am the first Indian to support him. So, if you analyze Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. Therefore, I say that Islam, unlike other religions, which speak good things, it shows you a way how to achieve goodness. So, therefore, if I have to follow a religion, I would follow a religion which speaks good things and shows you a way how to achieve that good things. Therefore, it is rightly said in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Lail Islam. The only religion accepted in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excuse me, we will not allow any further question. Just uh, on the basis of the organizer was. Okay, uh, another, he has requested that that person also should be allowed and two, three very brief questions. Yes, you can put forward your question, yeah. brother. My name is Manoj Raicha. My first question is. Under the name Universal Brotherhood, you are advertising Islam and on the basis of that, please define your terms when you are saying that Universal Brotherhood, you should, ex under the name Universal Brotherhood, you should accept Brotherhood to all, whether Muslims, that is follower of Islam and non-Muslims, which you say Kafir, who don't, otherwise quote the term Muslim Brotherhood. It will be okay. So, I asked a question that in the name of Universal Brotherhood, I am promoting Islam. Suppose if I have to say that, you no know, best cloth, I am promoting best cloth in market. And suppose Raymond's has to be the best cloth. So, it's a fact I am promoting Raymond's. If Raymond's company is best, anyway, I don't get any cut from Raymond's. That's an example. I am not a dealer of Raymond's. But if I say the best cloth is Raymond, and if the talk is which is the best cloth, I have to speak about that. Suppose I am giving a talk on who is the best doctor in the world, and if I have to take a person in XYZ, and if he's the best doctor, I'm promoting him, yes. So similarly, universal brotherhood, I'm telling you that Islam is a religion which speaks about universal brotherhood and shows you a way how to achieve it. Regarding a question, that in universal brotherhood, can you call Muslim and non-Muslims as brother, or only Muslims as brothers? The universal brotherhood of Islam is all human beings are your brothers. I made it very clear in my talk. I'm not mincing with words. I am very clear, maybe it may have slipped, you may not have heard it. I started my talk, it's for Hujura, chapter 49, verse 13. Ya ayu wa nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'ubam wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna kramakum inda Allah yadkakum inna Allah alimun kabir That, oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. And I have divided you into nations and tribes. So that you shall recognize each other. Not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness, who has piety, who has God consciousness. In the universal brotherhood are all human beings. The person who has got piety 
is one who has taqwa, or righteousness. I've got two brothers. One is a good person. Actually, I've got one brother only. But suppose I have two brothers. One is a medical doctor like this brother, and he's treating the patient, etc. And the other brother is a drunkard, he's a rapist. Both are my brothers. Who is a better brother? A brother who is a doctor and treats the people and doesn't cause harm to the society. The other brother is my brother, but he's not a good brother of mine. Similarly, all human beings are my brothers. But those who are closer to me are those who have taqwa, who has righteousness, who has piety. Anyone who has piety, who has righteousness, who has God consciousness, is closer to me. It's very clear. I send my talk and I repeat it. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Connected? You have differentiated Hinduism, Islamic and Christianity. In all three religions, there are good things for brotherhood. You have not explained brotherhood in Hinduism, brotherhood in Christianity. The brother said that I have spoken good things about Islam, universal brotherhood. I haven't spoken good things about Hinduism and Christianity. I did speak certain good things. I don't speak everything about brotherhood in Hinduism and Christianity because people may not be able to digest it here. This, see what I'm saying, people can't digest. I have to be patient. I know Christianity, I've studied the Bible, I've studied the Hindu scriptures. If I speak on that, I'm not here to create a rift. What I'm here to talk about the commonalities. So what is common I spoke? Hinduism says don't rob, Christianity says don't rob, don't molest, don't rape, fine. Other things on brotherhood. Do you know? Just a sample I'm giving you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6. It says, I'm quoting, chapter number, verse number, quoting. There's no two doubts about it. He told the apostles that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Christians. We are the Gentiles. Don't throw pearls before pigs. He calls us as pigs. Am I going to speak about that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, he says that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm quoting chapter number, verse number. So this means that that religion is only meant for the Jews, not for the whole universe. In other religions, they believe in monasticism. In monasticism. If you have to come closer to God, you have to renounce the world. You have to renounce the world. Most of the major religions, Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, to come closer to God, you have to renounce the world. Quran says in Surah Hadith, chapter 57, verse number 27, that it's against monasticism. Monasticism is not allowed in Islam. Our beloved Prophet said, there's no monasticism. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Nikah, chapter number 3, Hadith number 4. Oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married, should get married. Hadith says that. If I agree that if you renounce the world, you come closer to Almighty God, and if every human being renounces the world today, then within a span of 100 to 150 years, there will not be a single human being alive in this world. If everyone practices this law throughout the world, where is the universal brotherhood? Therefore, brother, I am only come to talk about the good points. Unless you want to have knowledge about other religions, it's my job. I have to speak the truth. Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ لَبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Hope that answers the question. Yes, the chief guest has requested. Uh, we not allow any further questions now from the mics, neither from here. We will now go into the next session. Now we will have the respected advocate Prabhakar Rao Hegde presenting his impressions as the chief guest. Dr. Jackie Naik and friends, I deem it my privilege to be here this morning to hear this talk by Dr. Zakir Nayak, the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, and I was really impressed by it. I am a Hindu, but don't go to the temples, neither introduce religion in my politics, I belong to the Congress. Here those who came to hear Dr. Hakir Naik 
should have seen and realized that he is a person who has to do with Islam religion and he will speak only on Islam religion. And I feel it very unhappy that some of the people who introduce religion in po politics tried to obstruct his speech by asking inconvenient questions. May I ask them a question? Have they read Vedas? Have they read Upanishads? Have you read any of the religious scripts or because it is convenient to be a Hindu to come in power, they want to canvass religion? My submission is, most respectful submission is, here I came to hear a Muslim scholar on, this, on the topic what his religion wants to convey. Whether I accept or I don't accept is another thing. But uh, I will tell you that the Hindu religion is there for thousands of years and Islam religion has come 1400 years back. It is a religion which has come up after seeing the torture done by other religions on the people of the world and therefore that is a religion which is more socialistic and has given more the method also how to implement. I remember in 1978 when I contested from Thana from this beauty, I met my friend Isaac Narbail advocate and he gave me the translation of Quran in English which I had gone through before I contested election. I still remember to have read The Contribution of the Muslim in the Freedom Movement of India, a book written by author and I am to tell my friends here who are talking about the religion in Hinduism that it was the Wahhabis who first stood against the British in 1833. It is not the Hindu that co collected together to fight the battle of independence, but it was the Muslim who fought the battle of independence. It is unfortunate that we don't, both of us don't go together. It is unfortunate for this country that, but it is really equally unfortunate that some persons want to canvas it and make it a point in politics to introduce religion. I am really impressed by the speech. I have learned a lot. Not that I agree with whatever he has said, but it's a way of thinking and certainly deserves a serious consideration and I am thankful to him. I thank you all. May I now request respected advocate K.R. Hingorani to present his presidential address. Dr. Nayak, Hegre Sahib, my friends, I am really honored to have been asked to preside over this function, though of course in a vacancy filling manner. But even then, I am really proud to be here and associated with the thoughts which are expressed by Dr. Nayak. I am not an expert on any religion, either mine or of Dr. Zakits. But one thing I can claim that I was born in a place where Islam was first brought in to the shores of India. I come from a province known as Sindh. For the first time in my life, I have heard a Muslim scholar, though I have heard so many Muslim Maulanas, who can understand and really read the things comparatively, not only from an exclusive point of view, as normally it is misunderstood by us that Islam is an exclusive religion only meant for compartmental people who believe in certain things and who disbelieve in other things. When he said that we should bring out the commonalities, the common things between the different religions first, and then disagree upon the points which we do not agree upon, I think this is one of the best statement that I have heard in my life. Once I had heard Dr. Radhakrishnan speaking in the same way on the comparative religions of India and after that, after about 50 years, I heard Dr. Nayak to speak that there are certain common things. And really there are certain common things because when he spoke about the taqwa, it's an Arabic word, I think that is the pronunciation. And he said it is God consciousness. I was reminded of my own Shivaism, Kashmiri Shivaism, which also talks about the God consciousness as being the fundamental force in life, that everything emanates from it, 
it is not born it is not created it is not come out of the womb of a woman it is self evident swambhu it is there in existence since time immemorial when the time had not started shiva was there and when he talked about god consciousness i was reminded of that hinduism as such is not restricted only to vedanta the four vedas are also very difficult to understand of course he has studied them i bow before his scholarliness and i feel that what he says is correct and i quite agree with him that hindu word is a geographical connotation and i am proud to say that it came into existence because of the sindh when the foreigners came to india they tried to cross the indus river especially sikandar and he said that it is sindhu it it is uh, it was it was told to him that the name of this river is sindhu and being an iranian or a yunani he could not pronounce sindhu he said it is hindu hafta hindu they call seven rivers as hafta hindu seven rivers so i am proud that the word hindu has come because the sindh was there and really in india we need this type of thing because much misconception has gone there that muslims are terrorists somebody asked a question i mean i think this is the most reprehensible statement that was ever made that muslims are terrorists this is all nonsense and it should be curbed and it is because of this that we feel that we are so insecure in this country you you cannot treat a muslim as a terrorist because he is a muslim he is a fundamentalist if he is a fundamentalist of the color of dr naik i welcome him i welcome him to my house and you must also know of course i have to talk about these things which i never wanted because when i came i had an spiritual experience by stock but then recently 2 3 days back there was a news in the paper that the front man for the person in dubai is a hindu i am referring to dr ramesh sharma he is the man who they claim to be the person who coordinated all the works of daud sitting in now whom will you say a hindu is a terrorist or a muslim is a terrorist therefore please forget these things forget about muslims have been there bad kings from muslims were there bad kings from hindus were there and they need to be improved but you can't say or hold anything against dr naik for what alauddin khilji did in his times or what aurangzeb did to his brothers or what akbar did these things are nonsense these are facts of history which you have to gloss over you want to live in this country try to understand the common things between the parties bring them out i request dr naik to go into hindu congregations and try to make them understand what islam stands for and as far my personal belief is concerned i think islam is one of the greatest things that has happened to this world thank you very much for giving me this honor and hearing me out Uh, now we would conclude with the vote of thanks by Maulana Ataullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. मैं ज़्यादा वक्त नहीं लेते हुए अक्सर एजुकेशनल सोसाइटी की जानिब से आप सभी हज़रत का बशमूल सदरे जलसा मेहमाने ख़ुसूसी मुकर्रिर और दीगर आए हुए मेहमानों का और तमाम सामयन का अक्सर एजुकेशन सोसाइटी की जानब से शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ और अल्लाह से दुआ करता हूँ कि अल्लाह तबारक पताल हमें मजीद ऐसे मौाक़े मुहैया करे कि हम एक दूसरे के साथ मिल कर के बैठें और एक दूसरे को समझने की कोशिश करें डॉक्टर साहब की तकरीर का उनवान बकौल अल्लामा हाली की जबान वही था कि यह पहला सबक था किताब खुदा का कि मखलूक कुंबा है सारी खुदा का खलायक से रिश्ता हो जिसको विला का वह महबूब है खाली के दूसरा का अब मैं फिर एक बार मजीद आप सभी अदालत का शुक्रिया अदा करते हुए आपसे रुख्सत होता हूँ